Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and today I'm bringing you my Kamigawa Neon Dynasty Limited Archetype Guide. Over the last week or so, I've given my thoughts on every single card in the set, and in this video, I'll talk about each color pair and the synergies contained within each of them. This isn't a video where I'll talk about cards that are just super good in a vacuum, like premium removal or bombs. Instead, I'll be focusing on cards that support particular archetypes. However, if you're just wondering about the best cards in the format, I've got you covered as there will be a top 10 on the biggest bombs in the format on Friday and a discussion of the best commons and uncommons in the set on Saturday. Also, before we jump into our first color pair, I want to say that if you enjoy my content and you aren't subscribed, consider subscribing. I would really appreciate it. Anyway, let's get started with a look at our first color pair. I wanted to begin by looking at the two tribal color pairs in the set, and we're beginning with blue-black. As usual, every color pair has what's called a signpost uncommon, that is an uncommon card that's in both of those colors that really tells you what that color pair is about. In this case, we've got Silver Fur Master, a ninja lord who also decreases the cost of ninjutsu abilities. So obviously enough, Blue Black is about ninjas. So let's look at the common and uncommon payoffs for doing ninja things. So first let's look at ninja payoffs. We've got our master, of course. It's also Kaito's Pursuit, which also gives your ninjas and rogues menace. I should say this is a ninja and rogue deck, but it's more about ninjas than it is rogues. Uh, there's also Kami of Restless Shadows, which pretty much is only going to work out well in this particular deck because if you're not returning a ninja or rogue from your graveyard to your hand with it, it's not very good. But if you're in this deck, you probably have 10 or so ninjas and rogues. And in that deck, it's going to be pretty decent. There's also Prosperous Thief, which is a ninja, and it also has a ninja or rogue payoff in that you get a treasure token when one or more of your ninjas does combat damage to your opponent. It gives you the treasure token, which can help you ramp and fix. I'm not going to go through every single ninja and rogue. There's a lot of them in blue and black, but we are going to look at, in addition to these ninja payoffs, we're going to look at the various ways to enable ninjutsu, because for ninjutsu to really work, you have to get a creature through that is not blocked. So there are various cards I wanted to look at that can help make that happen so that you can do powerful ninjutsu things. So what are some of the ways that common and uncommon you can enable ninjutsu? Well, there's Futurist Operative, which is unblockable when it attacks. It turns into a 1-1 that can't be blocked, so you know it's going to get through. It's actually not, like, incredible with ninjutsu, if only because paying 4 to play your creature again is a bit rough, but it does sort of guarantee you're going to get through when you can ninjutsu something. Uh, there's Goshintai of Lost Wisdom, which is a 0-4 with flying, and it only costs 2, so you can attack with this 0-power creature, get it past your opponent's blockers because it has flying, and then ninjutsu something into play, which is pretty nice, and then you can recast this pretty cheaply. Uh, there's Moonfolk Puzzle Maker. Um, it's not quite amazing or exciting with ninjutsu, but it's a relatively cheap evasive creature that also scries one when it taps, um, and so it's another creature that you can get in there with more easily than most, and then you can ninjutsu it back. Uh, there's Network Disruptor, and I think this is going to be sort of the common premier way for the ninja deck to do its thing, because it's only a one-mana 1-1, one, one, and not only that, but it has an Injure the Battlefield ability, and Ninjutsu, you know, in addition to letting you sort of throw a surprise attacker out there with some sort of effect, it also returns the creature to your hand, and so anything with an Injure the Battlefield ability gets you a little bit of extra value, because you can play the thing and get, you know, value out of it by using its Enter the Battlefield ability again. And the Disruptor does that. It also doesn't hurt that it's a rogue, so it's one of those cards that lines up with all of the ninja and rogue payoffs we just looked at. There is Grave Lighter, which is another card that's evasive, but also has an Injure the Battlefield ability that you can rebuy when you ninjutsu. Uh, there's Inkrise Infiltrator, a cheap flyer, which is good to, you know, return to your hand. Uh, Nizumi Prowler is interesting because it has ninjutsu, so, you know, it's the kind of thing you can put into play with these various effects. But it also has an effect that makes it a little bit harder for your opponent to block things because you can give whatever you attack with death touch and lifelink and you can just play this in your main phase and do it that way and then the funny thing is you can ninjutsu it back to your hand and then you have that effect again uh there's also high speed hover bike i mean i think this is a good piece of a, uh or vehicle in general um but it's particularly good here because like network disruptor it hasn't injured the battlefield ability and it's cheap and it's evasive and it's not that hard to crew either so it's pretty nice. Uh, there's also Searchlight Companion. This is another card that's just like pretty good because it's just a nice card that happens to be colorless and you'll play it in a lot of decks, but it's yet another cheap flyer that has an Enter the Battlefield ability and it'll just keep making you new spirit tokens, which is pretty sweet. So what rares are there for this color pair? Well, you've got Biting Palm Ninja, which gets here by virtue of being a ninja and having ninjutsu. 
Uh, there's also Thousand Face Shadow, same thing. It's a ninja with ninjutsu, so your deck's already set up to do things with it. Uh, there's Kaito Shizuki. This is going to be pretty good, you know, even if you didn't have any ninjutsu going on. But it also has the ability to make a ninja that can't be blocked. And while you can't return a token to your hand, uh, you can still ninjutsu by, you know, the token will disappear and you still get to put a thing in play. Uh, so the unblockable creature can help you set up your Thousand Phase Shadow or whatever. Uh, Katose, the Silent Spider, obviously it's blue-black, but it has a little bit of special synergy between being a ninja and having an Enter the Battlefield ability. So, you know, if you get to rebuy that ability, it's great. And there's also Satoru Umazawa, which is one of the biggest payoffs. It probably is the biggest payoff for ninjutsu in the format because it lets you look at the top three cards of your library and put one into your hand every time you use a ninjutsu ability. And if your cards don't already have ninjutsu, well, it gives it to them. So that's blue-black. It's about ninjutsu. It's about running evasive creatures to really enable your ninjas and ninjutsu and so forth. The other tribal color pair in the set is red-white, and it's all about samurai, just like the ninjas have their ninjutsu thing going on. The samurai also have a tribal, in addition to their tribal thing, they have a mechanical sub-theme, uh, and that sub-theme is that you want your creatures to attack alone to get all kinds of bonuses. As a sorry captain shows us here, uh, whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, it gets plus one plus zero until in a turn for each samurai or warrior you control. So, you know, like ninjas, there's also a second creature type, which is sort of the secondary one, but it does mean even more cards work with this. And yeah, you want to be attacking alone and sort of maximize a bunch of these attack alone effects. So when you do attack alone with one thing, it can do a lot of work. So what are the other common and uncommon payoffs for doing samurai things or attacking alone? Uh, there's Ancestral Katana, uh, which can equip for one when you attack with a creature alone. Uh, Iganjo Exemplar, which... It basically gives Exalted to your Samurais or Warriors because they get plus one, plus one when they attack. Uh, Imperial Subduer, which will tap down an opposing creature uh, if it or any other Samurai or Warrior attacks alone. And that's one nice thing about all of these. The way they're all worded, even if it's your only Samurai or Warrior, you get that effect when it attacks alone, which is pretty sweet. Uh, Narika Yamazaki lets you cast an enchantment card from your graveyard when a Samurai or Warrior attacks alone. Uh, Selfless Samurai gives lifelink to whatever Samurai or Warrior attacks alone, and also comes with the powerful ability to make a creature indestructible. Uh, Heiko Yamazaki, uh, sort of like Norika Yamazaki, lets you cast a thing from your graveyard, but in this case, it's an artifact. Uh, Peerless Samurai decreases the cost of your next spell if you attack with it alone. It's also nice that it has Menace, so it's a little better of a lone attacker all on its own than some of these others. Tempered in Solitude is next. It's interesting because it doesn't say anything about Samurais or Warriors, but it's obviously geared toward you attacking alone anyway, and you already have lots of payoffs for doing it, so it is going to work its best here, even though it does its thing for any lone attacker. Aki Ronin lets you rummage when a samurai or warrior attacks alone. And you can see how these can sort of stack into pretty scary effects. Uh, you know, even if you just have like two of these in play, attacking with one of them and it gets buffed and it lets you cast an artifact. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, there are a couple of good lone attackers that I think slot well into this deck that I wanted to talk about uh, as well. Uh, and they are Reinforced Ronin and Moth Rider Patrol. The Patrol is a one mana, one one evasive creature. So it getting those buffs and things is better. And Reinforced Ronin is nice because it can just keep coming down and being the lone attacker. I mean, the first time it's going to be kind of a surprise even as a one mana, two two with haste. And then it gets all of these buffs from your other Samurais or Warriors. And of course, you can also just channel it away if that's what you want to do. Uh, the rares that are well-suited here are uh, fairly obvious. One of them is Ryu, Storm's Edge. Uh, this has another one of these lone attacker payoffs. In this case, if you attack with a samurai or warrior alone, you untap it and there's another combat phase. Obviously, you know, in that second combat phase, you probably don't just want to attack with one thing again. But, you know, on his own, he can at least attack, you know, twice. And that's pretty sweet. And Ishin, Two Heavens as One... Uh, really likes these attack triggers because he doubles them. Um, so you have to splash black to make him work, obviously, but that's probably worth doing if you have enough of these triggers. All right, let's now move into the color pairs that are focused around artifacts, and we'll start with blue-red, which is the one that's sort of the simplest of them. It's just, you know, about artifacts. Uh, Enthusiastic Mechanaut shows you that as a 2 mana 2 with flying that decreases the cost of your artifact spells. So what are the other artifact payoffs that common and uncommon in blue-red? Well, we've got Anchor to Reality. This one's a little weird, um, but if you have a pretty sweet equipment or vehicle, uh, in your deck. Being able to tutor it into play is pretty sweet, but if you don't have those, you probably don't play it. 
As we'll see, it might be a little better in the blue-white deck, which is more about vehicles in particular than artifacts more generally. Uh, Covert Technician can allow you to uh, put an artifact card with mana value less than or equal to the damage it does to your opponent uh, onto the battlefield. And one kind of silly thing you can do, uh, for example, is attack with Enthusiastic Mechanaut on turn three, and then Ninjutsu in Covert Technician, which hits them, and then you can play the Mechanaut. You know, it's fairly situational, but that is the kind of silly thing you can do sometimes with the technician is ninjutsu back an artifact creature to your hand that costs two or less, and then also put it back into play, which is kind of cool. Also, as you can see, the technician and the mechanaut are artifact creatures themselves, and there's a lot of those in this format. Disruption protocol can cost only two blue mana if you have a spare artifact around, which is nice. Uh, Moon Snare prototype is a little mana rock that works well with other artifacts. It also works with other creatures. Um, and it also has channel, which is nice. Uh, Reality Heist, I think this is probably going to be the deck where this is at its absolute best, because as we'll see, the other decks that care about artifacts care about them in different ways. This is the kind of artifact deck that's the most into artifacts and them staying in play, really. So Reality Heist, being able to cast it cheaply um, is going to be easier in this deck, and you're also more likely to hit artifacts with the effect because your deck's going to have a lot of them. Replication Specialist comes with decent stats and with the ability to allow you to copy non-token artifacts you play by paying one generic and a blue. Sky Swimmer Koi lets you loot every time you play an artifact. Thirst for Knowledge becomes a better draw spell if you discard an artifact. Uh, Dragon Spark Reactor is pretty sweet. Um, it's a huge build around, like a lot of these cards at least do something, well, not Reality Heist, but most of them at least do something in any deck. Uh, and Dragon Spark Reactor really doesn't. You need to have a ton of artifacts in your deck to really get it going, and this deck can do it, and then it can become, you know, a win condition slash removal spell, which is great. We already saw Heiko Yamazaki when talking about Samurais or Warriors, but it also allows you to play artifacts from your graveyard, so it works here. Kami of Industry lets you reanimate a small artifact from your graveyard for a turn. Scrapyard Steelbreaker lets you sacrifice artifacts to get bigger. So Kenzin Smelter lets you sacrifice an artifact to make a 3-1. And this is sort of leading us into one of the other decks uh, in this color pair. The black-red one, as we'll see, is about sacrificing artifacts. Uh, and it's more interested in doing that than the kind of stuff this deck's doing. But obviously there's some overlap because some of the artifact payoffs in red involve sacrificing artifacts. Uh, you've also got Tawashi Song Shaper, which gets plus one plus zero when an artifact enters the battlefield and Voltage Surge, which becomes an upgraded burn spell if you sacrifice an artifact. Automated Artificer lets you ramp for abilities and artifacts. Network Terminal, um, it is a mana rock, obviously, but it also comes with the ability to tap it and another artifact to loot, which is nice. Patchwork Automaton is an artifact that gets a plus one plus one counter every time you cast an artifact. So what rares are well-suited here? Well, I have Jenga Taxius here, He's going to be good in pretty much any deck, but this deck is very likely to have the artifact spells to copy, and that's great. Uh, Tezzeret, meanwhile, is definitely going to be at his best in an artifact-heavy deck like this one. Uh, his abilities are all way better. If you have artifacts around, you either turn his plus one into, you know, it becomes a better version of Faithless Looting. Uh, if you have, like, mana rocks and other artifacts lying around, it can animate them. He even makes vehicles permanently into creatures. He decreases the cost of activated abilities and artifacts, and he has an anthem that says whenever an artifact you control becomes tap, draw a card. And Scrap Welder lets you give up artifacts and play to return one from the graveyard. So that's blue-red. It's sort of broadly about artifacts. Let's move down to blue-white, which I already mentioned a little bit. It's about vehicle artifacts in particular, as Prodigy's prototype shows us. You know, it's a reasonably costed vehicle with a decent crew that makes a 1-1 colorless pilot creature token with this creature crew's vehicles as though its power were too greater. And that ability is a general vehicle payoff. It doesn't matter if the prototype's the one attacking, you get that 1-1. And that 1-1 can crew the vast majority of vehicles in the set. What are some other vehicle payoffs? Well, we've got Born to Drive, which is an aura that you can put on things where it gives plus one plus one for each creature and vehicle you control. And I think the better option is channeling it to make two one ones with you know these pilot creatures who can crew things more effectively. You've got Hotshot Mechanic, who's a one mana two one who can crew things uh, as though its power were two greater. And it can crew everything in the set. There's nothing with more than crew four in the set and he can do it. Uh, Kitsune Ace can, whenever a vehicle you control attacks, you can give it first strike or untap the ace. So if the ace is what crewed the vehicle, 
it'll untap. Mobilizer Mech is a vehicle, and it's one that also allows you to crew another vehicle without having to crew it, basically. It turns the vehicle on without any crew effect. So if you have multiple vehicles, this deck's likely to do it. Uh, you're going to be able to crew a couple of things, and that's going to be pretty sweet. Uh, I've got Suit Up here. You know, if you watch my set review, you know I don't love this card. It's an interesting one this time around. I don't normally like these kinds of cards that just sort of um, upgrade a creature's stats and because they have sort of diminishing values. Like if you're using this on a 3-3, it's not that great. But it does have a cantrip attached, and it can, until end of turn, crew a vehicle, basically. And because it draws you a card, it's not unplayable. I just don't think it's that good. Uh, you've also got Mech Hanger, which is a pretty sweet utility land that, sort of like Mobilizer Mech and Suit Up, you can just pay some mana and crew a vehicle that way. It just becomes a creature. Uh, and you can also spend the mana from it, you know, uh, as mana of any color if you're casting a pilot or a vehicle. You've got Anchor to Reality here again. Like I said, it might be a little better in this deck because this deck's going to have more vehicles. Um, but you can also get equipment with it. It's not a card I love either way. You know, these sorts of tutors are usually underwhelming and limited. But it does, if it's going to work somewhere, it's probably here. So what rares work here? Well, we have a few vehicles that have vehicle payoff abilities. Surge Hacker Mech, for example, deals damage equal to twice the number of vehicles you control to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. So, you know, that's pretty sweet. If you have one vehicle, count, you know, and it counts itself, it does two. If you have two vehicles, it does four, at which point you're really doing it, and it can do even more. Mech Titan Core is pretty wacky, but you probably have the best chance at utilizing it in this deck because it wants you to exile other artifact creatures or vehicles you control, and when you do, you make this huge token, uh, and that's pretty sweet. Mind Link Mech is just a rare vehicle that happens to be very good, and it's in blue, uh, and it does gain the abilities of whatever it is that it that crews it, and you only crew for one, which is pretty great. And Reckoner Bank Buster is another rare vehicle that's really powerful that just, you know, lets you draw some cards and stuff in addition to just being a big creature. So that's blue-white. It's more about vehicles than artifacts more generally. Let's move now to black-red, which I already hinted at is about sacrificing artifacts, as Oni Cult Anvil shows us. Uh, it has a nice payoff that says, whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield, you create a 1-1 colorless construct artifact creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn, and you can tap it and sack an artifact to do one damage to each opponent, and you gain one life. So it provides you with a 1-1 every turn, and if nothing else, you can just sacrifice that 1-1. I mean, you have to get the 1-1 going by having something die, but after that, you can sack it every turn and drain your opponent one life, which is pretty sweet, but it also works really well with other sacrifice effects and things like that. So what ways are there to sacrifice artifacts? Well, there's Oni Cult Anvil, of course. There's also Dockside Chef, which can also sacrifice creatures to draw cards. Grave Lighter is interesting. Um, you know, if you could combine it with the Anvil, and if you're using the symmetrical part of the Grave Lighter, the symmetrical Edict, you get a 1 1, so you come out ahead. Uh, Reckoner's Bargain lets you give up an artifact or creature to draw two cards, and you gain life equal to its mana value. We saw Scrapyard Steelbreaker already. It gets bigger when you sack artifacts to it. So Kenzen Smelter makes a 3 1 if you give up an artifact and pay a mana. And Voltage Surge becomes a better spell if you sack an artifact. So what kind of things do you want to sacrifice? Well, there are some sweet things you can do. Uh, one of them is something like the Shattered States era. This isn't a card I love overall uh, for red, but if there's a deck, it works, and it could be this one, because if you have a free or cheap way to sack an artifact and you can steal your opponent's thing with Chapter 1, that's pretty much all you're going to need to do to get huge value out of this card, because doing that is backbreaking for your opponent. You effectively kill their creature and get value out of it, and uh, that's pretty great. Uh, we saw Kami of Industry earlier. The fact that it can reanimate a cheap artifact works pretty well with, with the sacrifice plan of this deck. Uh, Circuit Mender is a nice little artifact creature, one that gives you value when it enters the battlefield and leaves the battlefield. Ecologist's Terrarium can fix your mana for you, and you can choose to sack it to put a counter on something, uh, or you can just sack it to some other effect. Searchlight Companion gives you two bodies, so sacking it isn't too bad. It is unfortunate the token it makes is not an artifact. Uh, one of the sweeter things you can do, and I think this is something I, I overlooked in my set review uh, and really only noticed when I was putting this archetype guide together, is that Undercity Scrounger is the only way uh, in black and red at common that you can make, or uncommon, that you can make artifact creature tokens. Uh, and it, you know, being able to sack treasure to these various effects is quite good. 
And for that reason, it might be sort of a nice build around for this deck. This is definitely going to be the deck where it works the best. It's an artifact itself. It likes when things die. It really slots well into this deck. Um, and I think it's a card to keep your eye on if you're in black red. Probably won't be that hard to get because it's not that great in other decks. Uh, Papercraft Decoy has a death trigger ability that lets you draw a card if you have the mana to pay. Uh, you know, Sacking Virus Beetle is not too bad because it gives you a card worth of value off the bat by making your opponent discard. One of the other sweet commons, along with the Scrounger for this deck, is Experimental Synthesizer. When it enters or leaves play, you exile the top card of your library and you can play that card. So you get value when you sacrifice it. It can also sacrifice itself with its own ability instead of being sacked to some other effect, uh, which is nice. Uh, and we also have Heiko Yamazaki again. You know, it can keep getting back your cheap artifacts and sacrificing them and so forth. So what rares slot in well here? Well, we've got Hidetsugu, who's sort of a black-red gold card anyway, uh, and he likes sacrificing things to scry. He's also got an additional powerful ability that costs two generic and a red uh, that lets you exile the top card of your library, and you can play that card, and it also does damage equal to that card's mana value to any target. Uh, Mukatai Soul Ripper is a nice vehicle that lets you sacrifice an artifact or creature when it attacks, and if you do, it gets a counter and menace. And we've seen Scrap Welder already. It's probably better in this deck than it is in like Blue Red because you're more interested in sacking artifacts in the first place. So let's continue by looking at the artifact decks. Next, we have Black White, which I'm calling Enchart Effects because it cares about enchantments and artifacts. There's a bunch of cards uh, in the set, like Naomi Pillar of Order that check to see if you have both, and if you do, you get some value. A few of them check to see if you have one, and also check to see if you have the other, and you get like some value one way or another. But Naomi, for example, is all or nothing. If you play her and you have an artifact and enchantment in play, she makes a 2-1-1 white samurai creature token with vigilance, and she does the same thing when she attacks. So what are the other payoffs that care about enchantments and artifacts? Well, We've got Assassin's Ink. It costs one less if you have an artifact and one less if you have an enchantment. Obviously, it's premium removal everywhere, but it's at its best in this deck. Kami of Terrible Secrets uh, draws you a card and gains you a life if you control an artifact and enchantment. Okiba Salvage uh, is a reanimation spell that puts two plus one plus one counters on the thing you reanimate if you control an artifact and enchantment. Banishing Slash is another nice premium removal spell, one that comes with an upgrade if you have an artifact and enchantment that gives you a 2-2 token. Uh, Michiko's Reign of Truth gives you chapter 1 and 2, which give a bonus for each artifact and or enchantment you control. And on the other side, you've got Portrait of Michiko, whose power and toughness are each equal to artifacts and enchantments you control. There's also Runaway Trash Bot, which checks for artifacts and enchantments in the graveyard and gets bigger the more you have. And there's also Roadside Reliquary, which can be sacrificed to draw you a card if you have an artifact, and it draws you two cards if you have both an artifact and an enchantment. Uh, important to note too, and this is why I sort of transitioned it this way, all those black cards we just saw that are artifact payoffs also work here, just not as well, because you're going to have more of a mix of artifacts and enchantments and not be all in on artifacts but they're all things that still work in this deck to some degree. What are the rares that work here? Well, Soul Transfer, if you have an artifact and enchantment, gives you both of its effects, which is hugely powerful. Brilliant Restoration uh, lets you reanimate all of your artifacts and enchantments from your graveyard. Light Paws, Emperor's Voice, really likes auras in particular, so as we'll see, it might be a little better in the all-in on enchantment deck, but, you know, it does stand a chance here. Uh, and Grease Fang is obviously black and white, and it lets you recur vehicles, which are, of course, artifacts. So that's black-white. It's about enchantments and artifacts. Let's look at green-white now, which is about just enchantments. So we just saw, you know, we're sort of transitioning from the artifact-centric decks, and then we saw an enchantment artifact deck, and now we're looking at the enchantment deck, which is all about enchantments. Um, and Jukai Naturalist here is an enchantment creature with lifelink, that also decreases is the cost uh, of your enchantment spells. So what other payoffs are there for doing enchantment things? Well, there's Bearer of Memory, which puts a counter on an enchantment creature if you have one, and it gains Trample until end of turn. It's a little overcosted of an ability, but it is a payoff. Uh, Blossom Prancer, probably going to be pretty good in basically any green deck, but you're going to have the best card selection in this particular deck because you're going to have more enchantments than most decks, so you have the ability to choose between... Uh, more cards than your than other players do. You'll basically frequently be able to say, do I want to gain four life or draw an enchantment? Um, and that's a good option to have. 
Kimun with Spirits, you know, these kinds of cards are getting less and less impressive where they don't really have a real impact, but if you have a bunch of enchantments, its card selection becomes even better. Uh, Generous Visitor is a very powerful payoff. Uh, if you play this on turn one in this deck, it's going to be insane. You know, just imagine going Generous Visitor, Jukai Naturalist, Bearer of Memory, uh, and you just have counters all over the place. Geothermal Kami lets you return an enchantment to your hand, and if you do, you gain three life. Um, Story Weave is interesting. It's particularly good with Sagas. That's the enchantment angle here. Um, because you can put lore counters on one of your sagas, and the sagas in this set all become creatures, and it will instantly make that saga into a creature and give it two plus one plus one counters. So it's not as broad of an enchantment payoff as the other things we have here. It's pretty much just for sagas, but sagas are plentiful in green and white, uh, so that should work out pretty well. Uh, we also see Norika Yamazaki again. We saw her in the samurai deck. She's good here too, because you can cast enchantments. Regent's Authority becomes a better combat trick if you use it on an enchantment creature or a legendary creature. Skyblessed Samurai has affinity for enchantments, so it becomes quite cheap. Uh, shrine Steward lets you search up an aura or a shrine, and if you have those, you're going to be happy and you're more likely to have them in this deck. Just like we saw that the black artifact payoffs worked well in the black-white deck, the same is true about white enchantment payoffs in this deck. They can slide into the black-white deck too, but because that deck is less all in on enchantments than green white is they're not going to be quite as good but they do still give you some value in that kind of deck so what rares are well suited here well satsuki the living lore is a green white rare who really likes sagas she can also return enchantments from your graveyard to your hand kami of transients gets a plus one plus one counter anytime you play an enchantment and at your instep, if it's in your graveyard and an enchantment also went to your graveyard, you can return the Kami to your hand. Weaver of Harmony is an enchantment creature lord that also lets you copy activated or triggered abilities of enchantments, and this includes sagas. And we also have Light Pause again, who might be a little better here because the deck is more all in on enchantments. All right, let's move now to Red Green, which is about one of the set's new keywords, and that is modification. Invigorating Hot Spring is our signpost uncommon here. It gives your modified creatures haste, and it can also move plus and plus one counters off of itself and put them onto your creatures. And something is modified if it has an equipment on it, an aura you control on it, or a counter. So this is both a modified payoff and an enabler, which makes it a really strong signpost in common. So in addition to the hot springs, what other payoffs are there for modifying your creatures? Well, you've got Aki Emberkeeper, who gives you a 1-1 spirit token anytime a modified creature dies. You've got Ambitious Assault, which is a trumpet blast effect that draws you a card if you control a modified creature. You've got Flame Discharge, which becomes more efficient if you have a modified creature. Kami's Flare, which does two to your opponent if you have a modified creature. Uh, there's Upriser Renegade, who for each modified creature you control gets bigger. Uh, all the payoffs we've seen so far really only care if you have one modified thing, but Upriser Renegade is an example where you want a lot of it. Uh, Air of Ancient Fang, if it comes down and you have a modified creature around, it gains a counter. And obviously that means it's modified itself. Orochi Merge Keeper becomes a better way to produce mana if it's modified. Walking Skyscraper reduces its cost for each modified creature you control. So like the Renegade, it cares about multiple modified things. So too does Tawashi Guidebot, which has the ability to make something modified and draws you a card for four mana, but that costs one less for each modified creature you control. And you've also got Dramatist's Puppet, which, you know, it can kind of work okay in most decks because there's so many counters in this format, but it's going to be at its best in this deck because you're more likely to have counters around to do stuff with. I'm not going to talk about every single way you could modify a creature, but I do think this is one of the more aggressive decks in the format for the most part, and it has some devastating curve outs where if you're playing modified things, it's just going to be awesome. So I wanted to talk about some of the cheap creatures that are modified that allow you to really get these payoffs going rapidly. Uh, one example of this would be Kappa Tech Wrecker, which enters with a Death Touch counter, and that counts as being modified. So it's a two drop that's modified. And if you can sort of get those into play early, you saw some of the cards we just looked at, like the one who comes into play with a counter, or the one who gets plus two, plus zero for each modified creatures. Uh, if you're doing those things, you're going to be able to attack your opponent really hard early. And then Tech Wrecker is just a great card anyway. Uh, Iron Apprentice, this is probably pretty much the deck for it. Um, it's not really something you're going to be in competition with against others. I mean, it is an artifact, and so maybe other decks will be desperate for artifacts. But this is the deck where you play it as a one-mana card, and it's modified. And that's a huge deal for some of these cards. 
because they check for modification in the early game. So it comes down turn one, you've got a modified creature and you can just get going from there. It also likes when you put counters on it because it moves them to other things and thus you'll always have something modified most likely if it's around. Crackling Emergence isn't something I love, but if there's any place for it, it's here because it gives you a turn two modified creature, which can help set up your other things. Uh, Rabbit Battery is very cheap to use to modify creatures. Uh, I've got Generous Visitor here again. You know, this deck likes auras already because they modify things, and this also lets you put counters on things. Uh, Go Shintai of Boundless Vigor can add counters to itself cheaply. Uh, and Roaring Earth is just, you know, it's going to be great in every green deck, but in this particular green deck, if you can get it rolling early, uh, it's going to do a lot of work in terms of modifying your creatures. So what rares fit in well here? Well, we've got Kodama of the West Tree, who gives all of your modified creatures trample, and in addition to that, anytime a modified creature does combat damage to a player, you get to search your library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. There's Goro Goro, who comes with the ability to make a 5-5 Red Dragon Spirit Creature token for 5 mana if you control an attacking modified creature, which is quite powerful. Uh, there's Jugon Defends the Temple. This is another one that's just going to be good in like every green deck, but its Chapter 2 does modify things, and then when it transforms, it actually further modifies things and is a modification payoff in the sense that it gets bigger if you have enough modified creatures. Uh, Teachings of the Kirin. This is another cheap way to set up modifications early, but it's rare. Uh, it makes a 1-1 right away, and then you can put a counter on something on turn two, and then the creature it turns into has the ability to add more counters to itself. Uh, Thundering Raiju is a four mana 3-3 three, three with haste that puts a counter on stuff uh, when it attacks, and it also comes with the ability to deal X damage to each opponent, where X is the number of modified creatures you control. And there's also Kami of Transients. You know, this deck's gonna run a decent number of enchantments and it gains counters, so I included it here. So that's red green. It's about modifying your stuff and getting a ton of value out of it. It looks like one of the more aggressive decks in the format. Let's move now to black green, where we've got a graveyard theme, as we often do. As Gloom Shrieker shows us, when it enters the battlefield, you get a permanent from your graveyard to your hand. That's pretty powerful on a three mana two one with Menace. So, I mean, it is about the graveyard, but I think both of the last two archetypes we have to look at, which are black green and blue green, they're kind of good stuff decks with a mechanical sub theme, in this case, the graveyard. As you'll see, it's not like there's a ton of ways to take advantage of stuff being in your graveyard or a ton of ways to load your graveyard to really make this like a, its main identity that it's all about the graveyard. Um, so we've got Gloom Shrieker, we've got Dakuchi Silencer, which you can use, you know, it's a nice little ninja that allows you to discard a creature card uh, when it hits the opponent. And if you do, you get to kill something. So this deck has ways to get value out of the graveyard, so it makes some sense to include it here. We saw Kami of Restless Shadows earlier. I definitely think it's better in blue-black, but it does do stuff with your graveyard. Okiba Salvage, this is probably the best deck for it. Um, you know, if you can channel a creature away early and then use Okiba Salvage to reanimate something, it's good. Yeah, you're not going to get the counters as often, but if you can channel away an expensive creature and reanimate it, that's going to feel pretty good. And, and that is one thing, you know, channel in general works with this deck because you're throwing creatures in your graveyard when you channel them. Uh, we saw Dockside Chef before it lets you sacrifice stuff to draw cards. Uh, Season of Renewal. This is an enchantment payoff in the sense that you need an enchantment and a creature in your graveyard to get full value. Uh, but this deck really likes the graveyard and it's going to have enough enchantments to activate that. Uh, we saw Runaway Trash Bot earlier. It's the kind of thing that checks for uh, artifacts and enchantments in your graveyard. But that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not a great way to mill yourself in this format. There's like a couple of cards that do it, but neither of them are very good. Um, so it's mostly just going to be a good stuff deck where, you know, you're just using Gloom Shrieker for value. Uh, we've got some rares. You know, Teachings of the Kirin is one of the few cards that does actually mill you. We saw it a minute ago. Uh, and Kami of Transients comes back from the graveyard. So I included it here. But yeah, overall, Black Green and Blue Green did not end up with strong identities in this format, which that happens a lot, actually, with these two color pairs. But it feels like it's been a little while since we didn't really see a clear um, archetype for a particular color pair. Blue Green, similar thing. Uh, it's about channel, but also about ramp. And Colossal Sky Turtle uh, does showcase that for us in that it's a big creature that can win you the game, that if you could ramp into it is sweet. And then it also has two channel abilities. So let's focus first on how this color pair can ramp. So we saw Moonsnare Prototype earlier. It works here, helps you uh, ramp in the early game to get your big creatures out sooner. 
We saw Prosperous Thief earlier. You can use the treasure to ramp. Uh, Careful Cultivation can either channel to make you a mana dork, or you can use it to put it on a creature that can tap for two green. Grafted Growth is nice because it comes down, puts a counter on a thing, and makes a land produce two mana of any one color. Uh, Greater Tanuki is really sweet. It's probably going to be like the signature common for this deck um, because it is both a thing you can ramp into as a six mana, six five, a trample, and because it has a channel ability that ramp and growths, uh, you have that aspect going on too. Uh, we saw the Merge Keeper earlier. It's a nice mana dork that gets better at producing mana if you modify it. Automated Artificer, if enough of your ways of using your mana involve channel uh, or artifacts, then Automated Artificer works quite well. And Network Terminal gives you a nice mana rock. Uh, another key card probably for this deck to really do well is Azusa's Mini Journeys. If you play this thing on turn two in this deck, it's going to give you some insane value because it'll ramp you. Next turn, it gains you three life. And then it becomes a 3-3 who will untap three lands when it gets blocked, which is pretty sweet. It does have diminishing values as the game goes on. Uh, Bosiju Reaches Skyward is a nice card for this deck. It helps search up your forest to make sure you're getting your mana. You can even put a third land on top of your library if you want to. And then it exiles into a creature who checks how many lands you have in play. So, you know, this deck definitely has an identity of ramping and it's got a little bit of channel stuff going on too. What kind of things can you ramp into? Well, there's Colossal Sky Turtle and Greater Tanuki. And these two things are great for the deck because like I said, you know, in the early game, if you're not getting your mana going the way you need it to, you can at least channel these things away and that's gonna give you some nice value. It also means they're not only useful to ramp into. Uh, Mirror Shell Crab is similar. It's nowhere near as exciting as the Sky Turtle or the Tanuki, but it is another thing that's big that has an ability you can use earlier if you're not getting your ramp going. Roaring Earth, we already saw its channel effect will be particularly good here because of the mana you can get going. You'll probably be able to use Spinning Wheel Kick the best in this deck because you'll have the most mana and thus getting to like six and killing two things will be the easiest. You'll also have big beefy creatures to ramp into. Uh, I have Bronze Cudgels here because I think if there's a deck that it works in, this is probably it because you'll have a bunch of mana around in the late game and it could allow things to do a ton of damage like your Tanuki or Sky Turtle, both of which have evasion. Uh, Thundersteel Colossus, probably at its best here. This deck will have the easiest time getting to that seven mana and it's certainly an imposing creature. Uh, Walking Skyscraper is definitely better in like the modified deck, but... You know, if you have a couple modifications going on, it becomes even easier to ramp into in this deck. There's also a couple of cards that are more channel payoffs that I think we should look at. Uh, and they are Season of Renewal, which, you know, if you channel away something early that you want to ramp into later, it can get you with that thing back. And Containment Construct is particularly interesting. And this is one to keep an eye on because it has such an interesting effect where if you channel something away or discard a card by other means, for that matter, uh, you get the ability to play that card until the end of your turn. So if you have enough mana and this deck's going to be making it and you can channel and cast a thing, you can do both, which is pretty sweet. What are the rares for this deck? Well, uh, Shigeki Jukai Visionary both ramps your mana and has a channel ability that lets you get a bunch of stuff back from your graveyard. We already saw Jugon Defends the Temple. I have it here because it ramps you. And I also have the Kami War here. So this card is insanely powerful, but very difficult to cast. And it's sort of a stand in here for any off color bomb because this color pair has the most access to fixing. Uh, if there's any deck that can play insane bombs that are normally hard, hard to cast, this will be it. So those are the 10 color pairs in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. They all look pretty sweet. I think black green is a little bit of a dud in terms of how well supported it is, but Frequently, you know, there's not as much synergy maybe in black green as the other color pairs, but that doesn't always matter. Good stuff decks can be, well, good, uh, and we'll see if, if it ends up that way. So that does it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, including more videos about this limited format, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on the set review and the other content about Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can on Patreon. Thanks for watching.